heard people say all day that uh, a lot of what's already been, a lot of, a lot of what, is, what has been said is what's in my presentation. Well, I certainly, as the last one for the day, uh, certainly feel like that's funny. <laughs> but uh, here we go yet again. Uh, when organizing this conference, I fully intended to sit in the delegation chair regarding presentations. However, when asked specifically, specifically by a younger member of our delegation to address this topic, I hesitantly assigned it to myself. Anytime we attempt to assess the future, we are vulnerable. But to attempt to assess, or to assess is vulnerable, but to attempt to assess the future is even more risky. Reluctantly, here is my best effort. The topic is church music as we've known it viable is right with questions in and of itself. Who's church music? To what community and context does the church music belong? What are its intended purposes? How have we known it? However, for this brief discussion that we'll have today, we will attempt to assess the shared academic journey and vocation that draws us together here. Without the belief that training and inspiration within an academic setting is valuable, we would not be here, nor would we be living out our lives in the 21 different colleges and universities from which we come. The pursuit of knowledge and skills. Well, not too long ago, knowledge and truth reigned supreme, and we believed that knowledge was the basis for informed action. Today, personal experience often is the trumped card. Consequently, consequently, we now embrace the idea that experience precedes knowledge and that doing and being comes before belief. Knowledge for the sake of knowledge is not so highly prized as it once was. And that paradigm shift affects the way we impart knowledge and the way we interact with those around us. The goal of education related to a Christian calling seems to me to have always been about being prepared, being ready, and being willing to do that, which we are, that to which we are called. We have sometimes singularly adopted the idea that education is designed to prepare us to do when the purpose of education is also to prepare us to be ready and willing. Education should give us the skills that allow us to say yes to the challenges that God places in front of us. We must move past the idea that because we have been prepared in particular ways, God will provide predetermined positions for our students and for us. In reality, I am usually underprepared for most of what I'm called to do. <laughs> And I struggle, perhaps as you do, with the constant awareness that someone else could surely do the task more ably than I. It is time for us to reconsider the use of the term overqualified. Is it possible for anyone to be overqualified, especially regarding the ministry of the church? Furthermore, have we, have we paused to consider the arrogant implication of such a notion? <laughs> I recently served a year-long in interim in a church whose music ministry leadership position had been held by Baylor students for decades. <clears throat> it is a church not unlike the one I served in college. However, I discovered that the growth that I had experienced in the last 30 years did not overqualify me for this position. However, my skills and experience did afford me different ministry venues than I might have had at a different time. How could any of us be overqualified for a calling that is God's size? Mm -hmm. Yet for us, our responsibility, our calling, our position is ours. The door to which we have been asked to enter is indeed our door, and the decision to enter is ours to make. However, what God chooses to accomplish within those literal and figurative spaces to which those doors lead is not nearly all up to us. Our tribe is not increasing, and it is not winning. The study of the music of the church in academic circles has not increased, and we are, not, and we are seriously behind where any, anyone in previous decades would have imagined that we would be today in terms of the practice, the training, and the study of the music of the church. Some days I'm tempted to believe that our situation is not unlike the following oft-told and perhaps apocryphal Texas football story. When a high school team found itself behind 75 to 0 at halftime, rather than rant and rave as you might have expected the coach to do, 
He simply held up a football to the team and said, Boys, I think we need to begin at the beginning. This is a football. <laughs> According to Stanley Hirawas, perhaps there's nothing like being completely trounced to force teams, communities, and traditions to get back to the basics, to discover the elementary habits and practices that make them intelligible to themselves, end quote. I believe that for us, our beginning, our football, is worship and the very heart of God who is at its core. The rest of the game, that is music ministry in all its many forms, cannot be played without the full acknowledgement of God as our ground. While the church music major enrollment may have increased in your school, the overall numbers show a steady and a marked decline. The following figures are indicative. And you can see this chart, 1990-2000-210. Uh, Some of these figures were mentioned earlier uh, in Vernon's presentation, but you can see from <coughs> these figures that there's a, a steady decline over the last um, several decades. So I'll leave that for just a moment so you can look at those numbers. And that decline is even with some programs that we talked about today have come into being during the time that uh, these, uh, this data speaks to. Music and worship will not go away. As long as the church is the church and it will continue to be so, there will always be people who choose and are called to think more deeply about the <coughs> worship of God. If worship is what we say it is, then it is going to be studied contemplated, analyzed, reflected upon, and practiced. God is going to see to that. If we don't say yes, someone will. If we have a timely and relevant message, people will always turn to us for ministry assistance and insight. Committed people will seek out learning and training. People will receive education somewhere. They will be trained. The question is not will they be trained, but how and by whom. Our task then is to make what we do relevant to the church. We can choose irrelevance, but we will forfeit the sacred task of teaching. And as a result, we will rob the church of a new generation of leaders. The fact that we are teaching and training fewer and fewer people does not mean that training is no longer relevant. <clears throat> But it does mean that fewer and fewer churches have access to fewer and fewer formally trained ministers. While training can occur anywhere and at any time, dedicating oneself to intensive training at a given life stage is an effective model, and I think it's one that deserves to be nurtured and preserved. There's much to be done. Much scholarship and learning have been ignored for a generation or more. Movements that could have been chronicled and analyzed have passed. Pioneers who deserved interviews and a chance to share their story are gone, and with them their stories and the illumination for our path that they might have provided. It is time for the Academy to catch up. It is time for us to work on the backlog while at the same time moving into the future that just might be the church's finest hour, as we've already talked about today. Church music positions and academic posts are available, and the positions outstrip the number of qualified applicants. Questions for our answers. No generation has had a single mandate to which they have been able to focus their entire lives, and if they could, who would want to? <laughs> However, it seems as if part of my generation's mandate was to protect what the previous generation or two had constructed. Our educational process was one in which we were often provided answers to the questions that had already been asked. We were a bit like the off-quoted Henry Kissinger line from a press conference. Do any of you have any questions for my answers? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I recall very few church music professors who challenged me to ask questions or challenged me to have a larger God-sized curiosity. Consequently, many of us left the ivory tower of academia and went into the world and the churches only to find that the answers we were sent to deliver did not match the questions that either the church nor the world seemed to be asking. 
we have had to decide whether we would continue to deliver our well-crafted answers regardless of the questions, whether we would use the power of our education to intimidate the question askers, whether we would hold up with other like-minded answerers and well-armed fortresses, or whether we would assume the role of humility and recognize our own brokenness and the need for God-sized questions. On the other hand, the younger among us have seldom taken their learning at face value, and asking questions is a part of the culture by which they have been nurtured. While in a different day, offering answers seem to be the role of the academy, in our transitioning society, asking questions is normal, expected, and respected. Having too many answers is in fact suspect, as I believe it should be. Making sense of it all. So where does this leave the academy as the player in the nurturing of leaders for the church? What does this mean for those, who, those of us who have 10 or 20 good years left? What does it mean for 20-somethings who have 50 or 60 years left? What does it mean for today's freshmen, the church music majors who populate some of our classrooms and rehearsal halls? What is the future like for them? For starters, the way we were taught to think, or not to think, will no longer work. We must reimagine ourselves as ongoing learners, that is, living among our students, walking along beside them as co-learners instead of gurus. Our role is one of humility, in which we all join in a work that is bigger than all of our combined efforts. Recognizing that the work to which we are called is beyond our feeble efforts and us, assures that the work is God's. If we were able to do it by ourselves, it wouldn't be God's, and there would be little chance that we would ever give God the glory. Embracing humility will transform our teaching, and it will draw others to the most important tasks to which we, are, to which we have committed ourselves. Our calling is always to a task, a challenge, or a responsibility at the moment. It is actually seldom to a singular task for a lifetime. We do not know our future, and we do not fully know, and to fully know our future would be denial of our trust in God for what lies ahead. We are responsible for moving into this time, this moment, and this age with all manner of hopefulness into the faith called places that God leads us. Those of us who serve the church of the future must be creative, imaginative, and completely committed. Rare are the days of a career in church music. An adventure or a journey in leading the music of the church is a more apt metaphor for this generation and for those of us called to guide them. The goal of equipping and leading people into an encounter with God will not change, but the tools and the methods that we use will shift continuously. We must model flexibility and adaptability in all that we do. For if anything is true today, it is true that nothing will stay the same for long. For many of us, the generation before us prepared for their work, went to work, and the institutions and the institutions which gave um, and the institutions to which they gave their lives then took care of them in their old age. This model and the seemingly stable, stable, predictable model that it seemed to offer somehow got hold in the church and its ministers, and some of us were lulled into believing that such long-term stability and job security was also ours. As we can see, even from the last few years, our pensions have failed us, our institutions have let us down, and the devaluation of our portfolios have caused us to reimagine our future in ways that ultimately may be more healthy and God-honoring. Today, many of us will work full-time into our last years, and likely this is a better model of the way that God might have intended it in the first place. Discerning Priorities In the future, we will become communally dependent, as you've heard discussed a number of times today. We will work carefully with those with whom we personally cultivate deep and lasting partnerships. What will this say for those of us in academia? How will we function differently? Church musicians of the future, 
both in the academy and the church, as represented here in this event, must depend on the communities that nurture them on the, and on the families that give them spiritual life. We must stick together, even in the academy. If we can't work together for common goals, who can? Goals such as the following are ones around which we can all come together and which we can draw others. God desires to use the music of the church to draw all people to worship. God wants all people to use their voices, their gifts, and their lives sacrificially for God's glory. God desires to use the music of the church to transform lives and heal brokenness. God desires to use the music of the church missionally to bring <coughs> others into right relationships with each other and with God. And lastly, God desires to use the music of the church to aid in the formation of Christian communities in which we are nurtured and challenged. And we could add to this list, and you've seen a number of other lists today. How will we partner with others to bring about such God-sized aspirations? How will we draw others, including our students, into imagining a world of music that is yet to be? How will we move from self-protection and survival thinking into ways of living that connects us with the world outside our offices? How will we learn to recruit students because God and the church need them instead, our, <coughs> instead of our programs need them? How will we regain our hopefulness in order to live authentically hopeful lives among others? Perhaps our problem may be that we believe too much in the power of music to transform, renew, and challenge, and we believe too little in the God who created the music and endowed it with power to transform, renew, and challenge. In other words, it may be that we trust the power of music more than we trust the power of God. Finding encouragement. Recently at Baylor, we did not fully realize our enrollment goals. And in my usual take control fashion, I dissected our enrollment practices and blamed myself for failing to make one more phone call or send one more text message. However, I'm coming to realize that many of these issues are out of my control. In the final analysis, God needs these potential ministers more than Baylor needs them. And I am genuinely hopeful that they are studying somewhere else and that their lives are being nurtured elsewhere. Perhaps at Mary Hardman. <laughs> I couldn't resist that. <laughs> While I finally resorted, what I finally resorted to doing is praying that God will make up for the deficit and that God will call out others to fill these spots. What has happened in the last couple of weeks has been rather encouraging. I've had a series, a series of mostly unexpected conversations with students who love music and are struggling to discern how their love of music and their love of God might coalesce. I have no idea what might come from any of these conversations and whether any of these students may in fact become music majors or change their areas <coughs> of concentration. However, I do know that seeing the relief that comes over these students' faces when I assure them that God has a plan for their lives and that God hasn't forgotten them is at least enough for now. Through these conversations, I've come to trust God more fully that God is in control and my heart has been warmed and encouraged in my own call to ministry. As I have participated in these sacred conversations, I have been assured of my place in calling out others. And in each conversation, these young people have also called me out. Called me out to what? I'm not really sure. But like them, during each conversation, I am more willing to follow to places I am yet to discover. To follow with the same naivete that ultimately should embody any genuine encounter with the sacred act of choosing to take our always underdeveloped selves and allow us to participate in God's work of transformation. At the end of the day, literally the end of the day, we come to the thought that is prominent in C.S. Lewis's words. We make the choice to dance or to sit on the sidelines, to give what is ours or to live out of a scarcity framework 
withholding our gifts and shrinking our world. The choice of splashing in the waves or going deeper is up to us. The caution message is strong, and most rational people in our circles would encourage caution as realistic and prudent. However, the Jesus of the Gospel, who called our name in the first place, still calls us to radical commitment, to selling our possessions, to risking misunderstanding, to moving beyond what seems logical in order to end our lives more richly than we began. And I share the quote. There is a voice inside me that urges caution. It tells me to be careful, to keep my head, not to go too far, not to burn my boats. I don't want to be carried away into any resolution which I shall afterward, which I shall afterwards regret, for I know that I shall be feeling quite different after breakfast. This is my endless recurrent temptation to go down to the sea which is God, and there neither to dive nor swim nor float, but only to dabble and splash, careful not to get out of my depth, and holding on to the lifeline which connects me with my things temporal. Of course, that lifeline is really a death line. Thank you very much. Great summary. Uh, it's interesting he ends on that last line. When you see the word viable, the connotation usually is not a good one. It usually has a death tone to it. And so to use that in combination and talk about our, what we do for a living is a, kind of a tough deal. But we are, uh, some of us, facing some very, very serious issues. Uh, I'm going to go back and just, just real quickly hit on a couple of things or just a few lines that it's struck out to me and then you may, you may have some others. This one about we, we must move past the idea that because we have prepared in particular ways, God will provide predetermined positions for our students and us. I think that's how administrators, parents, and maybe how sometimes we think, how our colleagues think in, in, in our schools. Well, wait, you're preparing them to do a certain thing, aren't you? And the way that they're going to go out and do what you did when you were in college. Um, when I was here as a student at Baylor, um, we would just... Uh, I don't know if you remember this, but I, we just slobber all over ourselves if a church would give us an opportunity to, to go and minister in their presence. I didn't ask them for money. I just, can I have an opportunity? Um, right now, I can't hardly get the students to pick up on an opportunity if it's not convenient, if it's not across the street, and if it doesn't look like their youth praise band that they used to lead. There's a disconnect somehow or another. I'm being very, very intentional in my classes, in my intro survey class, which is a sophomore year class, Martha, not freshman. We do it sophomore year. It just ain't no room for freshman year. Uh, but we talk about this idea of calling avocational versus, versus vocational. And, and, and I try to be very careful to say, you may never make a living at this, but God is talking to you about doing something. And that's a paradigm I think maybe we need to break. Uh, this other one, if we have a timely and relevant message, and I just put dot, dot, dot on my paper. I, I had a chance about three years ago to, it just one of these things came out of the blue, and I said, well, I'll just follow it and see where it goes. It didn't go anywhere. But a church that I had had some connection with in the past, um, in other ways, called me to actually see, you want to come back and be in music ministry? And so I'm doing a phone interview with these people. <coughs> and, and this man says, and I got so offended, he said, well, now, you know, you're, 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 you're teaching, you're a professor, how you really stay relevant? How do you stay current in what's going on? <laughs> Implication being that because we are in the academy, we are not relevant. Um, I think we see this. Uh, and this is a little pendulum that has swung, at least in Baptist life, between the educated clergy to the uneducated clergy. And I think we're seeing a little bit of a, of a swing there. And that is related to this other thing that popped out to me, which is people receive education somewhere. What a wonderful line. Um, they do receive it somewhere, and they usually come to us having already educated themselves in some way on YouTube, uh, going to passion conferences in Atlanta, uh, which is great. I love it. I love White Flag. Man, that's, that's <coughs> like album change of the year. I just love that. Um, uh, just MP3s, going to concert settings. 
and, and blurring the line. I talked in one of my classes with my worship leaders about, well, are, you, are, you, are you in a concert setting here or are you a worship leader? Which, which are you? And what would you do differently if you're just Chris Tomlin at concert or Chris Tomlin at worship? And, and so I know the lines wobble back and forth, but those are all things that uh, Randall has brought to our minds here, and maybe there are other things that we need to talk about. One of the things that struck me in the presentation was the comment about we've allowed subjects and people that should have been studied and received academic uh, scrutiny to get away from us, like Where's a, a book on the Gaithers? You know, I mean, it had a major impact uh, on on our churches, uh, certainly. And uh, just yesterday, in our graduate uh, council, I was making a presentation. We have a doctoral proposal on the table for a doctoral program in church music here at Baylor. And one of the things I said is, you know, there's a, a misperception that we'll only study traditional church music, uh, quote unquote, but made the point that, that here at Baylor in the last few years we've had master's theses in the music history department written on Metallica and on British blues guitar playing of the 1960s, you know, uh, we still have ones on Bach and Beethoven and that sort of thing, but, but these subjects need to be covered in academic settings and I think too often those of us who are trained in a previous generation maybe have shied away from those subjects. We would have been told that wasn't a worthy subject, perhaps. <laughs> well, kind of what, uh, supporting what you said, I think one of the most interesting books that I picked up a few years ago was, is it The Message? In, in the message, the message, the message, 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 yes. And I yeah. thought, you know, this is one of the it's first critical book. analyses of a whole genre of music. I thought, you know, we've been doing critical analyses of hymns, traditional music, for, you know, decades, and it's time, you know, that we address the other. Of course, the thing about that book is, by its very nature, because it was using the CCLI Top 125, as yeah. I recall, that's already changed because yeah. the book's five yeah. years old. <laughs> the, 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 the whole premise is still great of comparing what is, as what was mentioned earlier today, about what is so often left out of the contemporary Christian songs as terms Trinity and other suffering and other sorts of things. But yeah, that book is great. Yeah, Barry, Barry, Barry Leisha has a comment about that in the New Worship about, you know, the Psalms, it's a discussion of the Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It's in my head, we talked about this in class last week. Uh, but, but are they really three different things? What are there? He takes you on a little little, little tour. Uh, but, but at the end of all that, you really, we really don't know, but, but uh, one of the things he said is, why don't you take all the worship music that you had in talking about the Psalms, look at all the worship music in your church and your ministry that you lead over a year's time, and then look at all of the variety that's in the psalms, just the psalms themselves. Does your music have as much variety and speak to as many things as the psalms do? And I usually put up a great big ouch on the screen. <laughs> I think one of the things to go on with the scholarship that I've alluded to this morning, may not have said it uh, as clearly, but is as one who's been at Fuller Seminary for the last couple of years and reading a lot in practical theology and whatnot, um, I just see an enormous amount of room for someone to come in and sit music ministry squarely in the field of practical theology and to outline that in robust ways. And that's, to my knowledge, not really been done yet. And I, I think since we're multiple traditions represented here, but one of the things I've had to come to grips with recently as a young Baptist is that, you know, 50 years ago, the Baptists were sort of leading the way, or maybe that's romanticized in my own mind, but um, to some extent I think that's true, and I'm not sure that that's the truth anymore, because as a Baptist, the writings that I pull from, the scholarship that I pull from, are from Methodists and Roman Catholics and Lutherans, and um, not many people in my tradition, and uh, that's been something to grapple with, and so as a young Baptist, I'm often left to ask the question, well, what does this mean for my own future? in this particular tradition, the faith tradition. I'll, I'll have to say this, too. Some of the <coughs> venues for doing that kind of scholarship are not open anymore. I know I've written for at least five journals that are no longer in circulation. I don't take full credit for that. <laughs> 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 that's, that's awesome. Uh, on, on the 
on the other hand, the internet allows for an explosion beyond the print journals. It's just not not uh, uh, sifted necessarily. It's you know not it's not jury. Well, yeah. but, the, but there are peer-reviewed uh, journals that are online now. Mm -hmm. But there are peer-reviewed the, the reality of this is, is that it's gone away from print. And if you were creative enough to start thinking that way right. uh, within our own contexts, this could be a, a, a great way to proliferate uh, intense scrutiny and evaluation of these subjects in a, in a very productive way. I'm seeing hopeful signs in that direction there because I know of at least two that are starting up this year. Right. I think that uh, he also they, pointed to... They haven't to asked you to write, have they? They <laughs> 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 better than that. Uh, I, think, I think Randall also pointed to something that, that is perhaps perceived reality because I, as I, I, I know a lot of you in this room and as I've gotten to know more of you, I think it's not really, it's either old news or it's incorrect news, but there is that perception of you're out of touch or you don't know or you're not really there. You're not with us that are in the local church. And I, I don't know if that's totally true, but that is, a, we have a PR problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, and, and we're struggling with this in Oklahoma somehow or another. Uh, in Oklahoma, there's been some kind of disconnect that has been perpetuated on a variety of levels. It's not just music or church music or anything like that. And we are working hard at that, trying to figure out what, what we can do to overcome that. But I think there is that perception. We have a PR problem. And, and, and you gave us some good suggestions, Randall, to, to begin thinking about how to... We don't like to say that. I don't like to even think that way because I don't know how to overcome something like that. But it is about relationships. We've got to build relationships. Um, you know. I suggest one other uh, item, too, and that is that we have a responsibility to prepare musicians for the future, certainly, and, and the present right now. But that's a, 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 a leadership issue, too. Part of what we do needs to be reactive to what the churches are doing, but we also need to be leading and saying, you know, what's happening in the church is not all good, uh, and so we need to be kind of both and. Well, and what, to, to say that we have a PR problem is for me to say, hey, wait a minute, you're not giving me a place at the table here. I don't want a place at the table because I think I've got something to give you that you don't have, uh, and there's something that you need. What, what I think all of us know is, is the truth. There, there are a number of people that are not, that are roadkill, on this, the roadside of ministry, that are roadkill not because they were not good musicians. It's because of some other failing or something that didn't, didn't click somehow or another uh, for them. It was a leadership problem or it was a people problem or it was an integrity problem. Uh, because the churches are now hiring folks that 10, 15 years ago they would not have hired. I was at, I was this last spring and summer I spent, it was an unofficial interim, they never actually hired me on as an interim, they just, they dribbled it out three or four weeks at a time, you know, can you come three more, you know, it's kind of like that, I was there like six months, um, but, but they hired a gentleman, this is the second large church in our area, and some of you would know one of the churches, if I named it, a uh, very famous church, have hired someone with no music, formal music training, a technological background, and in one the case of one of the churches, he couldn't even do the choir practices. His wife had to do those because he could not read music. And they hired them. And they hired them, and they're probably going to have long tenured times there at that, that those, those churches. This kind of goes outside of the realm of training undergraduate church musicians, but to speak to the point about uh, being a leader in, in the field, I think a lot of people encounter a block when they get to those people that have to hire them, especially if those people are clergy, because in this, in many seminaries, um, and gratefully here at Baylor, this is not the case at all, um, but in many seminaries, pastors get no theological, uh, no musical training, excuse me, whatsoever. Um, you know, they, it's so heavily oriented towards preaching and other things. They, the, I think the norm now is one course on worship and church music combined. Um, which I've spoken to some pastors, that, and, uh, and that's an optional course for them. So it's hard to expect musicians who come trained with these expectations of being a leader uh, to have any great success when the administration in their own churches is not amenable to that. Lee, we, we have, well, we've brushed it several times, but talking about curriculum, 
you know, our church musicians need enough theology to be able to engage in conversation. And they want it. They, they want that. With that preaching minister. The preaching minister may or may not have the music, is less likely to have the musical content <coughs> than the music minister is to have the theological content, because we do, we do deal with theology all the time with our text. I had discovered that in my, we have a, a minor in worship arts, which we initiated about four or five years ago, uh, and, and, and uh, what I had discovered is that some of the most engaged and sharp students when it comes to worship, worship theology, and talking about the practice of worship uh, they are the ones that get the most engaged. The music majors glaze over. Uh, and sometimes they're not even my sharpest when it comes to writing a paper or analyzing a hymn. Uh, the best, we, we uh, taking a tip from uh, Harry Eskew in New Orleans, uh, made us write hymn texts. And, uh, and I make them write a hymn text uh, at one point. And, uh, and, and the two best hymns that I've had written, in fact, one student, he, he lost it. He wanted to find it to use it. Uh, these are minors. Uh, and were, were not the best musicians I had, but they were the best thinkers. Uh, and they were deeply involved in theological study. Uh, so we need to do something with that. One of the ways we've addressed this issue is that the artists are teaching the theology classes. In other words, John Kenshin teaches the Old and New Testament principles of worship. And what happens, it gives us opportunity to know how to address the nuances that young artists are going to have that if they just took them over to the theology department they wouldn't get. And it's really been a win-win for us. And there's other, another issue I think that we keep skirting around here <laughs> that is really critical. The pastor is the chief worship leader. Mm -hmm. We like it or not, he is the chief worship leader. And either if he's not trained in any kind of worship then there's going to be a disconnect. And if we don't respect him in that position there's going to be a disconnect. Mm -hmm. And while we take on the role on the position and the title of worship leader or worship pastor, everything's going to rise and fall on that pastor's ability to understand what we do, how we do it, where we are, he, how engaged he is in worship, etc., etc. And therein is part of the issue, I think, that we've got to face. And we may have to engage a conversation across the campus, which it literally is for us, with the theology folks. Uh, and that's something that's already starting to happen for us. I'm excited to see where this goes. Well, I, would, I would suggest it's more than engaged. We need to, Mark's going to write, we need to aggressively go across the street and find out how we can partner. Well, that's, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. We're, 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 we need to become part of what they do, yeah. and, and that we're working on that. So, anything else? Terry?